The drive to increase truth value by increasing moral worth motivates continued recruitment of participants in the community of inquirers, that group of citizens in a democracy doing the heavy lifting of knowledge generation and social innovation. So perversity. As concisely as possible, the logic of the perversity argument is this. Everything back on it. Thus, in our context, the argument goes, trying actively to achieve sustainable development will only make unsustainability worse. Here, we are faced with the argument that local sustainability initiatives uh, that embody a new role in organization of government produce just so much warmed over neoliberalism. And these initiatives are likely to lead to more bland global monocultures of consumer cities and spayed and neutered local governments which no longer concern themselves with the public interest. The perversity argument operates in discourse about sustainability with reference to theories of neoliberalism and governmentality. Here, a variety of scholars, often in the post-Marxian or Foucauldian tradition, point to the move towards sustainability and governance as part of the shift towards government as steering rather than rowing, the ship of state. In this realm of discourse and theory, sustainability policy marks a departure from the origins of environmental policy in the 60s and 70s, which took such forms as environmental impact assessment, um, and endangered species legislation, policy sticks, and a move toward <coughs> the use of policy carrots, like partnerships, facilitative and mediative bodies, um, techno and creative class um, types of action, um, coalitions, etc. Partnership-based sustainability governance approaches take the position that government neither holds sufficient power and resources to enact and enforce new policies alone, nor should it be seen as the traditional experimenter for the nation from which new ideas and technologies flow. Instead, the partnership strategy holds, government can play its most effective role in leveraging different resources, understandings, and expertise, and finding new solutions by empowering those groups and individuals who are the true experimenters, primarily the private sector, uh, sometimes also including community groups and individual residents, to scale up their good ideas, listening to the ideas of others, modeling best practices on this basis, rather than regulating. In characterizing and documenting this shift from government to governance, the perversity argument frequently rears its head. This, this strategy may aim to increase the effectiveness and scope of sustainability policy by creating a more productive policy environment where a common state can be recognized and sought by all actors. <coughs> the result is revoking its unique authority and the unique, unique position of government of protecting the public interest. So, Whereas the intent may be to enable private sector actors and private individuals to think and act in terms of the public long-term interest. The result is that all actors in a partnership wind up thinking like a corporation. With citizens reduced to stakeholder status in terms of narrow protection of stakeholder values. In gaining P3 partnerships, public-private partnerships, multi-stakeholder groups and joint initiatives, we lose the essence of the government-citizen relationship, and the best incarnation of both governments and citizens are in fact reduced to the lowest common denominator. As the institutional structure thus shifts, so does the opportunity structure of governance, and no one is left to speak for the public interest to represent the citizens of today and tomorrow, let alone, like Dr. Seuss's Lorax, to speak for the trees. A strong example of this kind of perversity argument can be found in the work of UK-based Richard Cowell and Susan Owens. In their 2006 article in Environment and Planning, Cal and Owens argue that the planning process in the UK has been responsible for environmental protection and certain kinds of sustainability results via both direct means, like green belts, growth management legislation, and development mitigation measures, and indirect means. By indirect means, they refer to the public hearing and other traditional public review processes, which, in their opinion, have opened up crucial institutional spaces for challenges to the status quo. They recount numerous examples from their own research and that of others in which planning in the realm of transportation, mining and minerals, energy and waste was subject to a serious impact as a result of what transpired at traditional consultation and participation forums. These are the kind of interventions that are familiar to all planning students as the Nimbi, Lulu and Banana variety. So Nimbi, not in my backyard, Lulu, locally unwanted land uses, and Banana, build absolutely nothing. <laughs> the kind of confrontational, theatrical, and sometimes litigious displays that have nonetheless had a positive impact on the sustainability traits of plans in these and other sectors over the past few decades. Cowell and Owens go on to argue that in making the turn toward
toward the explicit creation of sustainability plans and policies, and in emphasizing new partnership and consensus-oriented plan-making in this vein, the governance system loses this trusted and effective channel for change. In striving to give planning a positive face, as opposed to the face of regulation, red tape, and adversary, new scalar tensions are introduced through which local concerns and oppositions can be trumped by strategic national interests. And particular interests by particular citizens for particular places are lost in the overall quest for a mythical, sustainable future at a global scale. Tensions are also introduced related to the timing of public input into the planning, with the new sustainability planning putting unproven support behind the possibility that earlier engagement from the public will entail fewer conflicts in the long run, a hypothesis that has received the strong support of the development community, which sees this approach as key to more streamlined and speedy development approval processes. This very argument is part of the interpretation of Vancouver's sustainability planning experience. City Plan, Vancouver's Comprehensive Plan, was developed in the early 90s to much fanfare for its unprecedented level of public participation, estimated by the process leaders to be upwards of 10,000 people. While the planning department bragged of this revolutionary innovation in planning practice, local academics warned that popular sovereignty had become a euphemism for abandoning responsible representative government. This resentment was well captured by former chairman of the Vancouver Parks Board, Art Cowie, when he lamented that Quote, the citizen participation process had begun to turn into the tyranny of a few who look after their own interests at the expense of the wider community. The hope implicit in the city plan process is ostensible redistribution of power to the public was that it would foster a greater sense of collective proprietary responsibility for planning decisions and therefore make otherwise recalcitrant citizens more willing to accept the inevitable trade-offs associated with crafting policy. But what if this wager was wrong? What if, instead of expanding common understanding of the public interest, participation and partnership in the name of sustainability planning was eliminating the only barrier to the work's excesses of development and only neutral arbiter of the city's interest beyond those of local citizens projecting their limited self-interest 10,000 times over? Did this transition make certain kinds of opposition impossible? So to take another example, Vancouver's relationship with livability is often considered a perverse one. So consider the recurring emphasis on Vancouver's success and livability ratings, which as a Vancouverite will be rated with every time the report is released on an annual basis. This one is from the Economist Intelligence Unit. Um, and lo and behold, Vancouver ranks first in livability. Um, we don't know what criteria they're using to develop this um, rating system because their methodology is proprietary. Um, however, we do know that although they're claiming that Vancouver is one of the most, well, is the most desirable city to live by their criteria, um, and that population growth is increasing region-wide from source countries around the world, it is accompanied as well by tragic trends of worsening poverty and homelessness. And this obviously is not figuring into their calculations of what is the most livable city. So here are just some uh, example statistics from the latest edition of Metro Vancouver Sustainability Indicators Report, showing population growth on the, um, in the left-hand bar uh, and immigration growth in the right-hand bar. But uh, also accompanied by uh, this increasing poverty rate, um, showing in the latest count over 1,500 people who are absolutely homeless. And this is a, a vast underestimation because it's based on a, a one-night count done on, on one evening in our one 24-hour period in, a, in March. Uh, and then a fluctuation of the pre-tax poverty rates in the line graph here on the right-hand side, which shows that the, the darkest blue line is Vancouver. So Vancouver um, consistently, uh, over the past 20 years, uh, higher than Canada and BC as a whole in terms of 